All right, that's good enough for me. So in terms of my side, we'll hand it over to Blake. Um, we'll go from Matt and then Sickles from there. I'm the account executive um, on the Honeycomb side. So I've had the pleasure of working with um, Blake and Matt and the SOMP team over the past year and a half um, as a part of their transformation piece and observability as a part of that. And it's been a ton of fun. So Blake, uh, hand it over to you. You can tell them who you are and what your role is at SOMP. Sure. Um, should I also introduce the company or would we just in personal intros first? Yeah, I mean, give a give a bit of like the company context and what sure, you sure. do. I mean, just yeah. whatever you think is relevant. So yeah, so SumUp is a started originally, I think, roughly ten years ago as a payments company serving like micro, what we call micro or nano merchants. Um, we're quite big in South America or Latin America and um, Europe, but we've expanded a lot over the last decade into like all kinds of products to help small businesses uh, succeed. Um, I'm currently leading the observability engineering team at SumUp um, uh, and just trying to help the very large team of developers we have and the product team that we have understand what uh, SumUp service quality looks like for our customers in, out in the field. Awesome. Matt, you want to kind of give, give a bit of an intro? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Um, so Matt, as I already mentioned, uh, I'm software engineer at the identity team. So identity and access management, which is kind of a core piece, especially for like a financial finance related company like us. And we went through a pretty big transformation since like the two years ago that I joined the company. And yeah, so just joining like here to to provide some additional information from from our side because uh, observability was a big helper for for what we went through. Awesome, and then Sickles one with you. Yep. I'm Michael Sickles. I'm one of our solutions architects here at Honeycomb. So the technical person who assisted Nathan and then helped. Blake and team implement Honeycomb uh, when they, they started, what was it, like a year and a half ago or so? Time goes fast. Good stuff. Awesome. Well, cool. Blake, um, I know you kind of hit on this already, right? Um, oh, yeah, but, um, I jumped yeah. ahead. <laughs> but feel free to kind of add any context. Yeah, I think kind there's of the next one, one. one other piece of context that's probably important here is just like the size of the organization. So I remember some years ago watching uh, an engineer I really respected talk about managing engineering scale at uh, Uber. This was quite a while ago. So at the time Uber had like, you know, multiple thousands of Git repos. And for me at the time, that was like a huge number. Um, and now I work at a company that does have thousands of Git repos and like tens of thousands of containers in production. Um, and I think it's, you know, multiple hundreds of engineers in engineering and a bunch of product people. So just like, in addition to what I said about like the fact that we've grown as a company in terms of what we offer, the size of the organization, the part of the organization or the teams in the organization that need to use observability tooling is quite large. And the collaborative challenges that come along with that are pretty significant. And that's one of the reasons that we ended up pulling in Honeycomb as a tool. Yeah, and so, so, without without getting into too much excruciating detail about dirty laundry um like any company that has this kind of like super scale out uh, scale up um ambition uh we built a lot of things really quickly uh and grew really fast and uh, at some point we started to get sort of some uh, like sort of, uh, let's say like customer support signals or like churn signals that we had service quality issues. Um, this is, I think, pretty normal for a company like ours. Um, so back when you and I first started talking, Nathan, and also when I first st started talking to Sickles team, it was because there were a couple teams within some of, especially newer teams, like there was Matt's team in Identity and the POS Lite team that I was part of um, that was building point of sale software. I kind of we had this hunch that we had some pretty severe service quality issues, but we were lacking information to kind of drill down and pinpoint what those are for particular customers or particular types of customers or types of requests, types of transactions. Um, and I had a conversation with our CTO, like maybe 
yeah, I guess about a year and a half ago now, or a year ago, um, where we looked at some of the raw, like the really general raw data we had from like our market research teams and said, yeah, we, you know, there's definitely things here that we don't like that we want to improve on, but we need to try to, we need a way to get better correlations between that data and what our systems are doing. So just knowing the old, the old question, like, is the site up or down? Like, that's not good enough anymore. Um, we needed to understand like how error rates were affecting things and how, um, uh, you know, request latency was affecting the customer experience, things like this. And we were really struggling to do that with, a, with metrics only or like metrics and logs only. And we were started looking for a tracing solution. Which just to add to this a little bit, I think one of the important parts there is also that this is ties to the expansion of that has happened over like the last few years where basically the company itself started in, in Europe where basically all the kind of the latency on its own it isn't really the biggest biggest measure or isn't that big of an issue. But then as we expanded to mostly like uh, North or South America and recently also Australia and different countries, then this started to kind of pop up more and more because all, all the data centers or most of the infra that we run is, is in Europe. And um, those weren't really things that we were considering at the time. And until we were finally able to see most of the requests or most of the stuff happening end to end, it wasn't kind of obvious to us that we are really hurting um, customers from these newer newly expanded markets where yeah really the the measurements from the services themselves weren't weren't enough to to tell that so that's just to expand on that a little bit yeah totally and then another thing too was like because of the size of the the engineering organization asking a single sre team to manage all of the issues that we were seeing or that we were trying to sort of control or mitigate was becoming increasingly unsustainable. So we needed to find a way to make individual development teams or like squads. Like we, we sort of have a semi like Spotify organizational model um, for better or for worse. And we needed to make these autonomous teams able to respond to service quality issues in their domains. Um, and when I joined, um, I was helping like one of our uh, sort of strategic initiatives like a team that had a strategic initiative, which is working on our POS point of sale systems uh, services, get better at owning their own uh, service quality. And when I kind of show, started to show those engineers the traditional like login and metrics alert system that we had, I got a lot of sort of like blank stares and or horrified looks, or you know, it was even a struggle to get people to want to carry a pager because the alert volume, like the signal to noise ratio and our alert volume was so bad. Um, so we started to do some experiments in that team to see if putting this sort of very opinionated style of service level objective that Honeycomb provides, if we if we could put that in front of our requests or like have that analyze the request coming into that team's services to see if a budget-based alerting system would improve the on-call picture for engineers that didn't necessarily have like deep ops experience. And that you know there were some bumps in the beginning because at first i had to we had to explain to people how a budget worked right um but that was like a game changer because i could actually tell people i could we we learned relatively quickly that we if an alert came in from an slo that we had on these services on the, like this domain of services if one of those alerts came in there was like an you know 85 to 95 percent chance that that was a valid alert that you really did need to get out of bed or you know leave the restaurant and go to your car and log in or something um, because you're on call that that was a huge game changer like it actually allowed us to put those teams on call um and that was something i think that we couldn't have pulled off if we only had more traditional signaling like logs and metrics it would have just been we would have had to do too much sort of devops training to make that work hey blake can you can you talk a bit about um i know i know what you're discussing is is like how um slo's and observability helped on a technical level, right, with budgets and error rates and being able to drill in and find um, what the true issue is. Can you talk a bit about, um, I think a big part of, of the observability transformation is, yes, there was technical bits involved and there's 
you know, directions. I know you can go there with the adoption of open telemetry and, you know, things like the honeycomb tool adoption itself. But can you talk a bit about the, um, the culture shift that had to happen and a bit of like how not only you went about doing that with certain teams and meeting when they're, where they're at, but maybe even speaking a bit to like the observability guild that you kind of use as a way to not just be the platform hitting on the head, but came in with a developer mindset as well. Um, yeah, we can definitely talk about that. I wonder, I see some questions coming in about defining what an SLO is. I, want, I wonder, should we, should we answer that first and then talk about the social part of this technical problem or? Let's do that. We... Yeah, we should, because okay. we're going to be talking about SLOs, right? Let's, let's, let's get yeah. the base level bet, understanding for everyone. I bet, I bet you, I bet you Sickles has a very good uh, one sentence description of an SLO that is very clear. So service level objective, right? So when we say SLO, that's what we mean. Uh, and it quickly, usually, typically you're, you have these different services. You want to measure like what is good and what is bad and how much bad can our users tolerate? So you have some kind of target. You have a, a way to measure that good and bad. Um, and, and there's different ways to do SLOs, right? So Honeycomb has our way, which is in more of an event trace-based system, but there's other tools that might use metrics for SLOs, right? You might have a, an availability. My website's able to be reached or you might base it on something like error rate, right? I want to make sure that people aren't experiencing errors or latency. And so the best way I think to really think about SLOs is what are my users experiencing my app as? Right, because that, that's ultimately, we want to take the nuances of the individual signals in our application. Uh, you could measure CPU and maybe your CPU is high, but th does that actually mean anything unless my users are experiencing any pain? If it's high, you're just paying and getting good value for your money if no one's experiencing pain. But if it's high and people are upset, right, they're having a slow response, that's when it actually matters. So let's, let's take the key workflows in our system. And this is way more than like one sentence and I'm sorry. Um, but imagine, right, like if I'm going to do something, I'm just going to load the page and it doesn't load as fast, maybe I refresh the page. If I'm trying to check out, right, like and, and process a credit card payment, that's really important because if that doesn't happen, you don't get to finish that transaction. So they, they have different uh, kind of like targets that you want to meet to make sure your users are happy. Both are important, just, you know, you want to measure it in different ways in, in those different targets. Nailed it. I knew, I knew I asked the right person. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you asked that, Nathan, though, because the, um, I think the, I mean, your question was about what happened inside the organization in terms of how we work, right? And based on this, and I think at least from, like one of the things that started to happen very early on was that we got, so we, the engineering org got really big, which meant that we had suddenly a lot of different units, like business units doing engineering stuff. So then that's cool because it lets you parallelize, but it's bad because it means you don't talk to each other, right? So one of the, one of, this was actually one of the reasons I wanted to adopt distributed tracing because I wanted to be able to show people data that would show how, what you do in your team, even though you are loosely coupled, uh, like your services still affect your teammates, right? And I think really early on, this is like part of the reason Matt and I were working together so much. We started to see the ways in which the identity team services were affecting things inside the POS domain where we were building services and vice versa. So we started to have all these conversations. I don't know, Matt, maybe you want to talk about what that was like, like kind of sharing, yeah, sure. like sharing all this query data, because um, that was really interesting for us. Yeah, so I think for us, this was mostly interesting from the perspective that we are kind of part of all, a lot of the flows that happen and a lot of the, I mean, from, from checkouts to, I don't know, online payments and whatever else, like usually there's at least one request that goes into our domain. So for us, like the, and I really love the analogy that we used at the time at the company, which was like lightening up the Christmas tree. So that was the whole initiative of bringing the observability in and having like full view into what's happening and where. For us, this was really basically what was happening because we were one of the first, I believe, to start kind of adopt the, the tracing. And then it, you start with like this huge unknown feel of like what's what's happening in between. And then we slowly start filling the gaps and just bring like this kind of this helped us discover a lot of kind of interesting stuff from requests that 
where, for example, for legacy reasons for eight years in certain flow and didn't make sense at all or weren't used at all. And suddenly you see all these things popping up and then you, by a few simple, like removing a few simple things, you can suddenly reduce a lot of kind of failure points and, and latency. So for us, this was mostly interesting from, from this part of having like stop thinking about the, uh, how to say it, like shifting the focus from, from single service to actually what, what is happening in the whole context of, of what the user is experiencing from, from their side. So I think that that was the biggest shift at least for, for our team. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think uh, like one one interview question I always used to give when I was hiring was like asking someone like, how does the internet work, right? Because um, I want to understand if, as an ops person, I want to understand if people understand like big distributed systems. Um, and when I got to sum up, it was like one of the one of the biggest, for sure, one of the biggest distributed systems or set of systems I've ever touched. And I was like constantly struggling to figure out like what the heck is going on. I was usually using much stronger language than that, right? But I was like, what, how does somewhat work? I don't know. And like, nobody knows, like all these documents are wrong. I mean, not, that's not really true, but you, you, you would always find these disconnects, you know, and then you'd be trying, struggling to understand like what's really happening here. Um, and having, having that sort of like, like the combination of distributed tracing and the sort of ability to like slice and dice data, event data and honeycomb by dimensions or by like attributes, super powerful. Which, you know, we also, and this is, I think, back to your, uh, your point earlier, Michael, about how, like, what is the, your opinion about how to do an SLO? If you have a service level objective that's just a metric, then you're kind of like, oh, my God, my, my budget is evaporating. Uh, why? Right? So then you're still, like, hunting, like, metrics and dashboards and trying to figure out, like, what the hell happened to my budget? But if you can drill down on that data, like that burn, that budget burn that's happening in your SLO and start to answer questions like, you know, what are the type, what attribute values tend to be true of events that are burning this budget? Like, are they, is it, do they tend to have an HTTP status of 500? Do they tend to have a certain latency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then suddenly this stuff's actionable. And then to go back to what I was saying earlier about like putting development teams on call that didn't have ops experience for them that is like a gold mine right they don't need to understand every little thing about your metric system or the tool they just need to understand what is being described in that service level objective and then like the bubble up view underneath kind of guides you towards the most interesting stuff so it really leads that like you know how does my system work uh, introspection that you need to do and then I think this got even better once we introduced our kind of standardized uh, attributes where we put the select channel and team names into the traces. So then you are basically called into some random incident that you might not actually know that much about, or you just simply join because you want to learn more and you can still kind of help by going through what is visible uh, in the traces themselves. And then suddenly you immediately know like whom to contact, even if it's just like a service you have never heard about. So that that was also like one of the things that helped a lot. And one more thing that I wanted, and now I completely forgot what, so I will hand it back. I, but that's such an interesting point, right? Because like, it's such a weird, like, it's not a problem I would have thought about before I worked in a team this big, right? But like, there's a, like in a team this big, figuring out which Slack channel to ask a question in, it can be very difficult. Right, because this stuff is like changing all the time, and we do want to move fast, even though we're a huge team. So I want to kind of follow up on that, and and actually thank you two for for that in, in that in regards of your sum up in general. Uh, I, and I'm not kidding; I can even show it one day to you all. But when I heard that you were putting team names as attributes, it kind of blew my mind. I'm like, why haven't we ever like? Ex like told other people to do this, right? Because we get the big distributed systems, potentially the larger the company, you have these, these segregated teams. It's just like, why not? You, It's just another attribute. It's just that whole thing we talk about of 
extra wide events and honeycomb. And so our, our current demo, actually, we, we actually did that. We added a team name in it so that you, know, you can see it in SLOs. You can see it in our new service map feature so you can filter down by team name, things like that. And it, and it was because I heard that you at sum up were doing that. I'm like, this is something other teams should do. It's 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 not, uh, it's very low lift to be able to add yeah, that. It's, yeah, it's, it's been so helpful. It's actually one of the reasons I asked your product folks to consider allowing us to like, have like an allow list for domains so that certain links when they appear in event attributes are actually clickable. I know you don't want to do that for anything, right? Because someone could like hijack that. But I mean, it's it's such it's it has been so valuable because you don't you we're always talking about having living documents, you know, so you don't have static documentations out of date, but it doesn't really you can say that all you want, but unless you actually are if unless there's some system that's constantly updating that data that tells you how things actually work, it doesn't help. Like you're still stuck with a, a living document that isn't actually that alive. So like having for us, having Honeycomb to some degree as like a living document for like, this is how things work and who's responsible for what, it's been super helpful. Do we want I think, to oh, talk go, go about ahead, like sorry. a specific, I was gonna say a segue, right? Do we wanna yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. maybe some more specifics? I know you, you have a specific maybe instance to talk about. Yeah, there, I think on the next slide, if I remember right. Yeah, this, this, is, this is like one of my favorite examples ever of like, this was like everything I could ask for to like kind of sell to internal customers, like to other engineering teams to explain to them why an SLO matters. So one thing, well, actually, maybe I'll ask a question. Does anybody notice anything interesting about the horizontal axis here? The time, just, it, besides the time? I mean, it's, it's just the it's time. Going, it's just the time. It's, it's just, just the months, fact that right? it's covering months. It's yeah, months, yeah. it's months worth of data, right? So this is um this is basically a screenshot. If if anybody's used Honeycomb as well as before, they'll know that like by default, there's like a heat map that shows duration in milliseconds for events across the, the, the time window of the SLO. And this is, we, we took one of those queries and expanded it to cover like a bigger length of time because we had a case where there was an SLO that tracked latency um, for a suite of services that did a whole bunch of things related to one of our products. Um, and we started to get, we started to see that we were in having more and more trouble maintaining a healthy budget for latency. So basically like in this SLO, every time latency for a request was above a certain threshold, that counted as like a bad, bad latency and it counted against our latency budget. So we kept seeing that our rate of burn on the budget kept getting worse and worse. And we were unable to like meet our targets for like the sliding window that we used to track this stuff. You know, just all classic honeycomb stuff for an SLO. But what was really weird about this was that when what we what we started to notice when we started digging further was that we would see this banding. So you can see that there's like these upper bound outliers that get closer and closer to a ceiling. And on the right hand side of the uh, the heat map, there you can see that we start to flatten out. Now, if you spend a lot of time looking at graphs and visualizations, and you're like an ops engineer, when you see that flatness, it kind of makes your like it kind of like makes your heart stop to some degree because it means that you're hitting some kind of saturation, like you're hitting a timeout or you're hitting like a cap on something. And pr this is probably bad. And what it actually is, um, is it's, there's a different system that's feeding requests to the system. And that system for safety reasons has like a hard timeout. So what we were actually seeing here was this, for some of our requests, we were seeing a trend towards hitting a timeout, which was like, which would be like a catastrophic failure, right? Like it's just broken at that point because we just killed the request before it completes. Um, but what was really great about using Honeycomb for this is that we were able to use bubble up, um, which I won't get into all the details of here, but in with like Honeycomb's bubble up feature, you can select a band of interesting events like that and then see which attributes are common to the stuff in the selection that you just made. And that allowed us to pinpoint that there were particular, just a handful, like I think, you know, maybe tens of customers of ours out of millions that we're seeing this latency problem. But then because we could actually see, because Honeycomb doesn't care about cardinality, we could see which merchant ID that was, like which customer ID that was. We could determine that this was actually a very big, very high transaction volume merchant, which, which means they're worth a lot of money to us. And also we could, we could start to reason about what the cause of latency was. So it turned out that this was a 
corner case performance bug and how we did queries for certain types of data. So we we're able to solve a pretty severe uh, database query like design issue long before anybody complained about this and before we lost like a huge customer and before any of our other customers would have hit this bug because every customer would have eventually hit the same bug. It was just a matter of time. And this customer was doing a certain type of operation often enough that they hit it first or this handful of customers. So this, this was like, you know, this is like exactly what you want as an ops person or a team that's maintaining or responsible for service quality. You want to find the issue before the customer does. We never had a customer service complaint about this, but we knew we would have if we hadn't addressed it earlier. I want to double click on something you said in there uh, in that you, you talked about your budget always burning. And when I talk about SLOs, I feel like that's one of the, the big things I'd like to talk about is you, one, you have different types of burn, right? You have a, if you have a consistent burn that's always happening, that's indicative of tech debt. And then SLOs become a negotiating tool and prioritization tool for your engineering teams, right? Because if you're always having this burn to whatever percentage, now we have to go back and we have to go to our product teams or our engineering teams and say, hey, what are we doing about this? Do we need to change our target and loosen it up? Do we need to change our how we measure success, raise the the duration limit? Or is this Probably. something that, that we need to tackle right now, right? Like, is this a pressing issue? And it, it forces that discussion that without the SLO, you really wouldn't have until somebody complains, a customer complains, that's, right? Yeah, that's, that's totally right. I mean, we, um, this sort of, that, that's exactly, that's literally exactly what happened. It forced us to have multiple discussions between, mostly between product and engineering, but to some degree with the business as well because we had to understand uh, what our sort of appetite for, for spending resources on this technical debt was. And we did tune those SLO targets in the beginning. We did decrease our targets to some degree, but we kept looking at that data. We kept seeing things getting worse. And then because we saw this flat line, we could see that we were reaching this sort of like point of no return, like a point at which it would be unsustainable tech debt. So we, but the fact that it was trending like this, that we could watch this trend, meant that we could plan forward. Like it was a very clear sort of trend upward. So we knew exactly how much, uh, uh, we knew exactly how much runway we had to fix the issue and we could plan around that. And so it, it was, I think it was like a three or four week saga kind of, which included like long technical calls with cloud vendor engineers that were like responsible for the service that we were storing data in. And it was like really, it was like your classic like, giant expanding sea of complexity. Um, but we the good news is that we did actually solve all those problems before customers complained. Yeah. One thing uh, that might be uh, ref, uh, relevant to in, in, in the same story to the big merchant, but on a much smaller scale, um, Matt, I know you mentioned before with the uh, the chicken farmer. I think Blake, uh, Blake is able to tell this story way better because he experienced yeah. it kind of firsthand. I just remember yeah. Yeah. This is, remember this is one of the most ridiculous kind of the buck or production threats that that we had so far. Yeah, at that, I mean, that was more like the way I remember it was that that was more. This was like the middle of last year, like last summer or something. I think it was more. That was the other case Sickles was talking about. It wasn't a gradual degradation. We would just see certain days when the SLO budget would just go like this, like into a nosedive. And it took us a really long time to, well, it would have taken us a long time, except that we were able to slice by these attributes. So when we were looking at the SLO, like the, the, the bubble up attributes, the dimensions on the SLO page, we kept noticing that it was like one merchant. And then at the same time, we were working with the hardware team to add more attributes on things like device serial numbers and device manufacturers and stuff like this coming into the our hardware edge APIs. And we were able to demonstrate there was like one, I think it was like one, one uh, handheld Android device that belonged to some like cooperative of teenagers in the Netherlands that sold, uh, um, that sold like free range chicken eggs. So they just had one bad device. I don't know if it was like a really old version of our app or if it was the device itself, but that was a, that was a crazy example of like drilling all the way down to something really small that was really probably causing like merchant pain somewhere. 
And then we could talk to customer support and say, hey, you know, such and such a customer, like this conglomerate of uh, egg selling teenagers, they might be having a problem right now. And here's all the information you need to ask questions. Beautifully worded in pun. That's perfect. <laughs> cool. Um, well, we, we, still, we still have a saved query somewhere in Honeycomb that is called the Eggman or something like that because <laughs> we were riffing on like that old Beatles song. Uh, this actually could be a good segue to the next slide, Nathan. Uh, yep. and, and this is this is going to be me. Uh, I'm going to propose a loaded question here. Um, on Nathan, if you want to switch slides, right? So there's this. You we'll get to some more of the new ones, but related to what you just said, um, something that you might not be able to do in traditional tools, but you could do in Honeycomb is potentially exclude that one device ID. Like, did you guys consider that? Like if you, th this one person was causing a lot of burn and it's possible, right? You could have potentially have one customer or one tenant that causes a lot of burn that you, you're aware of the issue, right? And so it's like, how do I make sure I don't get woken up in the middle of the night? Did you guys think about maybe modifying your SLOs temporarily? Or did you like, what was the path there, I guess? I'm not sure if exactly on the example of the Egg problem that we had, um, but basically what also happened over the time as as the company grew was like initially the focus was on the micro and like small merchants, basically single person or I don't know someone giving yoga lessons in the evening or selling a chicken eggs whatever. Uh, but as the time kind of went, we also acquired super large companies uh, that now work with some up nowadays. So I think. It isn't really that we would be excluding for someone, but what I think was really interesting was just like segmenting the SLOs for for these smaller kind of uh, smaller and micro merchants where the targets are are kind of different from from these super large companies where we either need to uphold to like much higher kind of standards and the reliability is kind of big focus. Um, the time and everything that we need to fulfill there is way more not way more important, but basically. We are talking about super large contracts that uh, where we really need to make sure that that we are obligated to to what we promised. Versus having this large segment of of smaller merchants, where, for example, having a slightly higher latency for for a certain period of time might not meet, be that big of an issue. But that way, we can kind of segregate those into two different groups and then base the SLS on on that. So that for me was definitely yeah. So and I think I think. I think that case of those sort of like key accounts that you're talking about, like these really big customers we have, that was a case where that kind of drill down or fo like updating the SLO queries allowed us to focus on particular sets of use cases. And then whatever we learn from solving problems for those customers, those that had like, you know, huge transaction volume, all those learnings would then apply to the rest of our customers. So it allowed us to like focus a lot better instead of just wading through like a sea of information. Also, I think a very a similar, we, did, we didn't actually filter out the egg device that we were talking about, uh, Michael, but we did, um, we did do something similar. One of the early weirdnesses that we noticed was, or one of the early filtering things we had to do was the hardware teams had to go filter out a bunch of, or kind of like populate like a list of device IDs that we use for testing that we didn't want to track in our hardware edge SLOs. Right, because those devices we expect to do all kinds of crazy stuff. We need to do we we make physical hardware, so we have to test hardware. We have test rigs for that. Um, we don't want to send that to like a different backend than the rest of our systems, right? Because we're doing testing, but we also don't want to get woken up because a something on the test rig is is breaking. That's something that is like a QA problem. So we do filter like that. Just not it's we do filter by device IDs, but not for the the egg one. Yep, but this uh, that that points out like one of the biggest benefits and you, you had the other big benefit right uh, earlier we'll, I'll, I'll touch that in a moment but like when you take a an slo based on metrics right you alluded to this earlier a metric is inherently just aggregated information you can't take that metric and what compose it and break it apart you're just stuck with whatever it is and you said earlier right you you use a traditional tool uh, they have other S, like other tools have slos no doubt about it but now you're left jumping somewhere else to figure out why why is this burning right whereas and it's by switching it up and basing it on like events or traces, you have the underlying data. We can 
you know, change our definition to be arbitrarily anything, exclude certain test devices, right? That, that, that would just get aggregated in the metrics and you're just kind of stuck with changing your, your target. Instead, we can actually exclude them or, you know, we can actually get meaningful insights, not have to jump around. We have it right there. Is it the egg customer or is it, you know, my large customer? Is it, you know, you can segment it in any way that you want to really uh, take it in whatever path you want to take it. Yeah, and also like like you kind of touched on tracing there, but that's it's like when you start to see the budget burn, you look at dimensions to figure out roughly what types of things are causing that burn, but then you further drill down through that dimension onto the traces for which that dimension is that bad value, and the tracing it's not just about like what systems are interacting. It to go back to what Matt was saying earlier about stuffing team metadata in there. Um, you, you start to figure out who you need to help you fix this problem. Because ideally, right, like we have microservices, right? And we have like a distributed team model and everybody's autonomous. So you should, everybody should be able to fix their own problems. But that's not really how software works, right? It's actually, uh, I think somebody, some famous internet person said it's a team sport shipping software. Um, it's, it's very true. Like we often need to know who, like, you know, which other special team kind of to pull in to help us solve a particular problem. And I also think what's what's interesting about this part is that for what for one team might be completely fine behavior might from other team be kind of considered to be something out of ordinary. So for for us, for example, for our team and like the identity and access management, like seeing a 403 status or 401 status codes is completely normal and expected for whatever reasons, but then sometimes we hit a box, box where basically for the team that relies on us, it was some edge case that they hit and suddenly uh, we still consider the request to be fully valid and behave just as just as expected, but for their service, this was kind of unexpected behavior. So then it makes it also easy for, for other teams to, to drill down and see where the issue actually is. And this isn't something that we would be able to spot on our own, and it makes it way easier for, for other teams to discover like where the actual underlying issue lies. Yeah, I feel like um, I feel like something I've heard, Blake, you say plenty of often. I know it's not technically original to you, but I feel like I'm pinning it more and more to, to you is um, naming Honeycomb. Like it's not an observability tool. It's an analytics tool for production same way like a bi tool is for just data right yeah um yeah so I, some I of the mad how you explained that made me think of it so yeah I, I i just want to go on the record i cannot take credit for that one it was somebody in an olicon that was like tweet live tweeting about olicon or something i cannot find a reference to the tweet um also twitter's a bit scary right now but uh anyway i can't find reference it wasn't my it wasn't my phrase but when I, I when i read this tweet i was like oh my god that's exactly what it is it's a analytics tool i'm doing analytics on production and that really helped cognitively for me to like start getting good at the primitives that are in the tool i, I see there's also a question in the chat about cardinality um i think the best story i can remember and maybe you have one too matt but the best story i can remember about this is like looking at some of the documentation we had for shipping metrics data from some of our edge or client applications. And we had documentation that literally said, don't put customer ID in these metrics, right? Because the cardinality is too high, the index is too big, it's too expensive, it's too slow. Um, and having a tool where that just didn't matter was like so liberating. And I also remember going to teams like my old, my my previous team where we were doing a lot of stuff with like sale or transaction histories. I remember asking somebody at Honeycomb, it might've been Usicles, like, can we put transaction ID, can we record transaction ID as a as a uh, an attribute? And you're like, oh yeah, no problem. And that was like, uh, you know, I'm old enough that I grew up on like Nagios or like whatever, open NMS, stuff like that. So just the idea that I could do that was, uh, so crazy and so cool. Blake, um, this is a bit of a loaded question, um, but um, as far as today goes, how much are you still relying on like the traditional logging and metrics based tools? And you know, I guess the second part of that is like, do you see your teams moving even further from those from those methods in the future? Do you just like kind of a mix of both in there? Um, 
And it's pretty geared towards the honeycomb thing here, but curious to know what your perspective is. You, you want to take that one, Matt? It would give your answer and then I give my answer because we might have different, we might do different things with different tools. <clears throat> no, well, I think that, I mean, we obviously still do. Um, I believe that mostly like this part is important for the kind of legacy systems where either we, for example, have some super old Ruby applications that were simply incorporating the tracing was hard or isn't sufficient enough. But just again, like another example that I really like uh, is that we have added like this trace ID into most of the logs. If it's available from, from like the context of the request, then it's actually click through. So when you like get the trace ID on, on your log in, in Grafana, you can just click on the trace ID and it automatically takes you to, to do Honeycomb. So you can like see the whole trace for it was like a good game changer so now there are like any issues in in the legacy systems where you have like this whole yeah. not knowing what is going on you can go back and forth between honeycomb and grafana search for the locks for for the legacy system where you don't have the full trace or where you can't really do the breakdown of what's going on and then again from there if you find something like within this Ben close to close to the lock or different locks within the same time that you are interested in, you can again get back into the into the trace in Honeycomb just to drill down on what's going on. So that that to me is just one example of uh, where this works pretty well. Yeah, I mean one one thing I've noticed is that like different tools are good at different things, and I think for me at least. For sure, Honeycomb is like kind of my first stop, right? Like it's how I orient myself around the problem, how I figure out who's who to involve, um, how to figure out how bad the merchant impact is. Um, you do, you do, you do still need uh, metrics for things like resources, right? Like, is is my event slow because I'm out of resources, or did I have errors because something crashed because I had resource exhaustion? So you do. It is still good to have metrics for stuff like that. Um, it's just that my use of metrics is personally, at least, is much more focused on particular things that metrics are very good at. Um, and for logs, what I see a lot with teams is like sometimes having that sort of like stepwise sort of like text based thing is good if you're debugging. Um, but it kind of depends. I'm not, I'm curious to see like this. We're kind of, I think Q4 of last year was kind of our first quarter where we were fully instrumented or fully there in Honeycomb. Um, and so I think that for the rest of the year, we'll be interesting to see like whether people, cause like events in many ways are just like fancy logs, like logs with more features. So I'm very interested to see how, uh, what happens as people start to notice things like, oh, wow, querying events is much faster than querying logs, uh, because of how the data is stored. Um, but I, I do still see people using logs for things like stepwise debugging. Like you, you wrote the code and you kind of needed, you wanted to see like a text-based list of, you know, what was going on. And that's fine. It's a, it's a good tool for that. I don't think, you know, we also in open telemetry as a, as a standard, we have all the signals, right? We have logs, metrics, and traces um, because there are cases where you want those particular signal types to do certain things. Gotcha. I know we have some questions in the chat, but just um, real quick on as we kind of do AMA um, stuff and things like that. Uh, I know Bethany just posted this in the chat below. Um, so definitely keep the questions coming. Um, Blake, I know we have one in the chat right there. Um, housekeeping item, if you complete the survey uh, from this slide or on the uh, chat in the Zoom link uh, before tomorrow at 12 p.m. Pacific, we'll send you a t-shirt say thanks. Um, so just check that link that Bethany dropped in the, in the chat. So, um, Blake, any thoughts about the question? Um, the question. I can, like, I can read it out. So the, the question was, what was the big difference you saw between New Relic and Honeycomb for application insights? Was migrating Honeycomb fairly easy? And did you leverage open telemetry? Um, so maybe I'll answer it backwards. And I think Matt might need to help with some of this, but, um, we did, we made a decision early on because we were kind of late to the tracing game. Actually, we were lucky. Um, we started implementing right as open telemetry, like the signal, uh, the tracing signal for open telemetry was exiting the beta stage and becoming like a stable spec. 
Um, so we were able to put all of our bets on open telemetry. We just went all in. We were like, we don't have anything else like this right now. Let's just go all in on hotel. Um, I think even back then, that was not that painful, um, even in the beta days. So I think now it's much better. Like I think the auto instrumentation landscape is really good. So I don't, it's marginally more difficult than New Relic Agent, but as someone, I think I used New Relic like the year that they launched and I, I used them in production for like a decade. Um, I don't see in terms of integration, I don't see a huge difference between the two. Um, and I think the biggest difference probably from my point of view is that Honeycomb doesn't spoon feed you as much as New Relic does. Um, so you might have a little, slightly steeper learning curve in the very beginning, but you get a lot more flexibility out of that. You get you get to decide how you wanna think reason about your data. Um, and like, for example, Sickle's question about filtering out stuff, filtering things out in Honeycomb, if you use like the Terraform provider for Honeycomb queries um, or Honeycomb SLOs is super easy, super easy. Doing this in New Relic is like just, I mean, it's, I. I I say this from a place of love because like New Relic saved my life so many times back in the day, but it's just, I don't want an opinionated tool anymore. Personally, I, I'm much happier with this sort of like open-ended, uh, very professionally, this very flexible tool, which is Honeycomb. Um, and then, was, oh, and about, was, was, it, was it easy? Um, so Matt and I probably worked on, Matt and I spent a lot of time working on very old apps together, trying to get, open telemetry instrumentation working on them. Uh, if your app is really, basically, I think the hotel community doesn't support languages over a certain age. I don't want to say too much about this, but because um, I don't, because of the whole like dirty laundry principle, but if something's really crusty and you haven't touched it in a while, you might have trouble instrumenting. But if, if it's an app that you know well um, and that is actively maintained, then you're in good shape, I think. Um, and yeah, I think Matt and I were talking about right before the call here. Uh, we do, we spend a lot of time at, at some of talking about customer satisfaction and like we do these quarterly surveys, like a lot of companies. Um, I think Matt, it's safe to say that Q3 for us last year was challenging. That would be how, that's how I would say it. Uh, gentle, um, good. yes, challenging. Exactly, Q, Q, Q3 was challenging. A lot of people really like, uh, that was right at a pivotal moment, I think, for us as a company where we were really refocusing on service quality and getting Honeycomb everywhere, um, hotel everywhere. Um, and we did see a huge difference between Q3 and Q4 last year. I can't talk about actual numbers because of you know privacy stuff or confidentiality stuff, but we did see a huge change. I don't think that was just because of Honeycomb. I think that was also some of this collaborative stuff Matt was talking about before. But Honeycomb helped make that happen for sure. Yeah, it was the overall shift to kind of focus way more on the observability. And here I think it was really important for the teams to like see the actual impact of the individual services on the overall uh, behavior of the system as a whole, which I don't think we had we were able to kind of visualize uh, visualize before. So that was definitely one of the helpful things. And of course, like it can probably really be attributed to single thing. I guess the overall movement in, in this direction was what really helped a lot, but indeed like the, the reliability and um, these issues were a huge pain for us. And I think in like Q2, Q3, we started hitting the point where we simply acquired too many um, customers for, for our size and we started seeing these issues uh, kind of manifest in one way or another. So like this overall shift towards having the observability everywhere and being able to tell what's failing, why, where was what really helped a lot. Gotcha. I think we have another question in chat from Carol. Do you rely on cloud SDKs and your key business flows? If yes, how well supported are they with OTEL instrumentation in your experience? That's an interesting question. I'm. What do we mean here by cloud SDKs? Is this like, for like example, AWS like serverless probably, stuff? Or? Yeah, like yeah. probably yeah, the AWS stuff and AWS or GCP or Azure SDKs. I, I imagine. don't know that we use cloud SDKs super heavily, at least not in the teams I work with. I don't know about your team, Matt. Neither do we. 
Yeah, I know. So, like, I know a lot of. I know a lot of open. A lot of. I know a lot of open Solomon Street libraries have, are, like cloud vendor aware, right? So especially the more mature ones, like the uh, SDKs for Java, like Hotel for Java. If you if you if it can talk to like the Amazon APIs, it will give you all kinds of information about like you know which availability zone you're in and blah 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 blah. Um, I think. I don't know. Maybe maybe the honeycomb folks know more. I feel like Otel is new enough that a lot of vendors, the bigger vendors, are kind of slow to get their act together here. But I'm not sure. I would say it depends. Um, AWS is ahead of the curve. I'm just gonna say that uh, they they have all the AWS SDKs are in most of the languages automatically instrumented. If you're using that, uh, you'll get all those great. Uh, attributes from anything AWS related. AWS is a big contributor to open telemetry themselves. Uh, so it, it depends on your language, depends on what you're using. I, I think it's, it's generally not hard to incorporate and it's, it's generally pretty well, especially anything AWS. Um, Lambda, there's some nuances uh, that we've learned. Uh, it's in our docs, you know, some of those nuances, let's just put it that way, but it, it still works. Uh, we have it in our demo working and it's, it's not too, too painful once you get past it, like a no of those nuances. Uh, for other cloud providers, it, it depends. Um, I, I think all the other cloud providers are starting to move to open telemetry support as well. You, you start seeing it and that they're offering at least of ways to get OTEL into their systems. And so it's to their benefit to continue to make OTEL as a just open source project, be well supported. Uh, and just to point that out, like open telemetry is the number two project in contributions in GitHub behind Kubernetes. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the next year or two that it surpasses Kubernetes. Hot take, hot take. Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things I've heard from Philip, who is um, one of our senior product managers really involved in the uh, OTEL community is, um, you pay a tax for observability and you either pay that tax with um, a vendor agent or you pay the tax with a one-time tax with open telemetry and you're spending forever, right? So I think like in some cases, um, Blake, I know there's like not everything was auto instrumentation, right? So there's like some things where it's like, this is manual and we have to like go through and instrument this, but now you're done and you can look at those attributes that you can get deep insights into. And if there's a day where when it comes start to suck, you point it towards a better tool, right? So I think there's a lot of, a lot of value in that. And to your point, Sickles, like, you know, it's it's getting better, um, even faster because of the inertia behind it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 like I'm not, I do not have a CS degree. Uh, like, I'm one of these people that kind of like fell into operations engineering uh, out of the back of a truck, and like, I, so my programming skills are like, you know acceptable but i wouldn't i would not i would not call myself a great programmer but like i was going around instrumenting stuff that you know like all over the place and ton, like all kinds of different languages and like muddling through early in this in this effort and then like once we got more engineering like, muscle in it got easier and also the libraries got easier and so it's it's really not that difficult and you have you have like lots of paths you can take you can do the manual instrumentation path but there's also lots of good auto instrumentation lives out there that behave more like a traditional agent. So, you, you know, it's, there's a lot of options you have. And, and Honeycomb has great docs too on this stuff. Um, like for Otel, awesome. so it's not Honeycomb specific, um, but it'll work well with Honeycomb if that's your, your Otel backend. For sure, for sure. I've got a few minutes left here. Um, any kind of closing thoughts, Blake or Matt, um, about, you know, what uh, I know we talked a lot about like, you know, the impact of SLOs, you know, where you've been in the past, where you're going, um, anything y'all want to share about uh, what's ahead this year in terms of what you're looking to achieve with SLOs um, now that you're past the initial adoption stage as we kind of close out here. Want to take it, Blake, or should I? <laughs> if you, go for it. Like, <clears throat> if you have something in like mind. At least speaking like specifically about our team, like we have a few few things that, that we would like to migrate from one system to another. So we use some open, um, open source projects that we kind of need to replace with our own kind of implementations. And one of the things that uh, I think we had a really good experience with previously when we did similar things, like these online migrations of, of systems was just like being able to to drill down on what's actually happening behind the scenes and also during the whole process of debugging the 
as Blake mentioned before, like with the logs having the um, having all, the whole log in front of you and being able to see what what uh, what is happening, like when it comes to multiple systems interacting here, like having the tracing and being able to see the whole system engine that that will be super super useful. So I really hope it goes better than than last time when we were working on similar things and oftentimes we ended up kind of testing in production where we weren't able to spot all the edge cases. So now with having most of these systems that sum up instrumented, I really believe that it will be very easier for us to catch these issues early on. And yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it makes it makes makes it makes feature flag roll out a lot easier. I think from my point of view as like the observability guy kind of or like I'm not the guy, but I think some people think of me that way at some point. Um, couple, there's a couple of thing, couple of things we're thinking about from an observability engineering point of view, like um, tooling wise. One big one is like working together with our mobile dev teams on getting better uh, instrumentation in from our mobile applications. Um, this is kind of like somewhat bleeding edge um, for Otal. And then the other thing is probably getting closer to analytics, like figuring out how to get some of this data into the hands of our analytics teams. So over like longer time periods so that they can look at his very old historical data about things like service quality and plug it into these reports you do about customer satisfaction and churn and stuff like that. So that's that's kind of what we're thinking about, I think. Beautiful. Cool. Well, I know that's all the time we have for today. Um, Blake and Matt, thanks for joining from the summit side. Sickles, thanks for hopping on as well. Um, just uh, for those of you who attended, just be, be on the lookout for the link uh, to watch the webinar on demand and uh, feel free to share it if you got some out of today's content. So you can check some of the links that uh, Bethany posted in the Zoom link, uh, Zoom chat for other interesting webinars coming up. But other than that, um, hope you all have a great rest of your week and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much. See ya.